Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today we are starting from hadith number 19. An Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma qala kuntu khalfa Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yawman faqal ya ghulam inni u'allimuka kalimat ihfaz Allah yahfazuk ihfaz Allah tajidhu tujahak إذا سألت فاسأل الله وإذا استعنت فاستعن بالله وعلم أن الأمة لو اجتمعت على أن ينفعوك بشيء لن ينفعوك لم ينفعوك إلا بشيء قد كتبه الله لك وإن اجتمعوا على أن يضروك بشيء لم يضروك إلا بشيء قد كتبه الله لك عليك رفعت الأقلام وجفت الصحف رواه الترمذي وقال حديث حسن صحيح وفي رواية غير الترمذي احفظ احفظ الله تجده أمامك تعرف إلى الله في الرخاء يعرفك في الشدة وعلم أن ما أخطأك لم يكن ليصيبك وما أصابك لم يكن ليخطئك وعلم أن النصر مع الصبر وأن الفرج مع الكرب وعن وأن مع العسر يسرا this hadith is narrated by Abu Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He says that one day I was behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam riding with him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O oh young man, I shall teach you some words of advice. Be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Be mindful of Allah and you will find him in front of you. If you ask, then ask Allah alone. And if you seek help, then seek help from Allah alone. And know that if the nation were to gather together to benefit you with anything, they would not benefit you except with that what Allah had already prescribed for you. And if they were to gather together to harm you with anything, they would not harm you except with what Allah had already prescribed against you. The pens have been lifted, the pages have dried. This part of the hadith is narrated by Imam Tirmidhi, and he says regarding it, it is a good and sound hadith. In another narration um, that's narrated by other than Imam Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said, Be mindful of Allah and you will find Him in front of you. Recognize and acknowledge Allah in times of ease and prosperity, and He will remember you in times of adversity. And know that what has passed you by was not going to befall you, and what has befallen you was not going to pass by. And know that victory comes with patience, Relief with affliction and hardship with ease. This is a hadith full of content and just by reading and listening to the translation, the text of the hadith, we can understand that there's so much to discuss in this hadith. We'll start off by discussing a brief biography of the narrator of the hadith, Abu Abbas Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah. He is the son of the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, which makes him the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu's cousin. Abbas radiallahu anhu's father, I'm sorry, um, Abdullah radiallahu anhu's father Abbas, he was an uncle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, they were similar in age. So Abbas is from the younger generation, the younger children of Abdul Muttalib. He was born in the Shi'ab of Bani Hashim three years prior to migration. If you study the prophetic biography, what you'll learn is that three years prior to the migration, during the seventh until the tenth year of Nubuwa, this period here was known as the period of the boycott. This was the period in which the Sahaba and Bani Hashim were put at boycott by the Quraysh. And it was during this period that Abdullah ibn Abbas عنه, was actually born. And actually not only during this period, he was born towards the end of that period. His mother's name is Umm al-Fadl. And she is the sister of one of the wives of the Prophet wasallam, Maymuna radiallahu anha, which is going to play an interesting role as we'll study ahead. Not only is Ibn Abbas عنه, a cousin of the Prophet wasallam. Not only is he a close companion of the Prophet ﷺ, but his aunt is the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. His khala, she is the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. He 
He had many children amongst them. His oldest son was Abbas because of who he is also called Abu Abbas. He had a son whose name was Ali, another son whose name was Fadl, Muhammad, Ubaidullah, Lubaba, and Asma. These were the children. These were the children of Abdullah bin Abbas radiAllahu an. Abdullah bin Abbas radiAllahu an is known from the Mukathirun. He is known to be from the Mukathirun. These are those companions who narrate abundantly from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Any Sahabi who narrates over 1,000 ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam automatically falls into this category. He is one of these. He narrates close to 1,660 narrations from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, out of these narrations, it's very important to understand. Very few are narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam bila wasta. Most of his narrations are not directly from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They're actually through other companions. And the reason for that is because Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu he was born in Makkah Mukarramah three years before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam migrates. He accepts Islam at a young age. Him and his mother both accept Islam at a young age. However, Abdullah's father Abbas, the, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's uncle, he delays accepting Islam to close to Fath Makkah, the conquest of Makkah Mukarramah. That's when he accepts Islam. So Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu himself says, as Imam Dhahabi rahmatullahi alayhi quotes. كنت أنا وأمي من المستضعفين أنا من الولدان وأمي من النساء والمستضعفين من النساء والولدان Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes reference to those who are weak in Makkah Mukarramah and were not able of migrating from Makkah to Madinah Munawwara He says my family, my, my mother and I were from those group of people who were weak we weren't strong enough to make the migration we weren't ready for the migration my mother is from the women who are referenced in the Quran والمستضعفين من النساء نساء means women he says, Ummi min al-nisa. Wa ana min al-wildan, and I am from the children that are referenced in the Quran, min al-nisa wa wildan He arrives in Makkah Mukarram. He arrives in Medina Munawwara finally after his father accepts Islam after the Hijrah. Sorry, after Fatah Makkah, after the conquest of Makkah Mukarram. That's why the historians they say regarding him that he was a companion, he had the opportunity, as you'll find in Tahdib. I'm sorry, in many different reference points you can find this. That he was in the company of the Prophet wasallam as a companion for about 30 months. 3-0. Around 30 months he was in the companionship of the Prophet wasallam, which puts it under 3 years. However, there are some narrations that he narrates directly from the Prophet wasallam, And this is one of those narrations where the Prophet wasallam is speaking to him directly. Most of his narrations are not from the Prophet ﷺ. After the Prophet ﷺ passes away, he makes it his journey to go and study from the companions, in particular the Ansar. He would go to the Ansar one by one and he would study the deen from them. And there are some narrations regarding that, some very interesting stories. That one time, Abdullah bin, Abba, Abdullah bin Abbas ﷺ, he sat outside a Sahabi's door during the hours of the afternoon, when it was very hot outside and it was common for the Arabs to take a nap during that hour. So he waited outside and waited and he said, I waited so long that I took my shawl, I made a pillow out of it, and I fell asleep on, 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 the, on, the, on the concrete outside his house, on the doorway. He said, the Sahabi woke up to leave his house. When he saw me lying there, he woke me up and said, what are you doing here? O cousin of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abdullah bin Abbas said, I came to study from you. So this man said to him, "Ana haqu an atiyaka. I should have come to you. Ala arsalta ilayya. Had you not sent someone to me, I would have come to you. You're the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu There's no need for you to come to our house." So Abdullah bin Abbas radiAllahu anhu then said, "No, I am the student of knowledge, and I am the one who should be coming to the teacher. The teacher doesn't need to come to the student. It's the adab, it's the etiquette that the student goes out of his way." He waits outside his teacher's door, regardless of whether it's hot or not outside, and waits for his teacher to come out. Where are those students gone? Where is that time gone? In our day and age, students of knowledge teach, treat Islamic knowledge as if it's some sort of a product, a commodity. We live in a consumerist society where we want everything to be just for us. The customer is always right. And we bring that attitude, that mentality to our seeking of knowledge as well. But when we look at these young men, like Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu, young child by the way, I don't want you to think someone in his 30s or 40s. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passes away, the scholars actually differ in opinion how old he was. And the opinion that holds him to his highest age 
is that he was 15 years old. That's the oldest age, by the way. That he was 15 years old when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And according to one narration uh, that Imam Dhahabi quotes from Sa'id bin Jubair, Tuwafiya Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ibn Ashrin, that he says that I was 10 years old. Ibn Abbas says I was 10 years old when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Zubair ibn Bakkar says that Ibn Abbas was 13 years old. And it seems that Imam Waqidi rahmatullahi alayhi, the famous historian, agrees with this opinion. He says that there is no difference, Imam Waqidi says, لا خلاف أنه ولد في الشعب That there is no difference of an opinion amongst the scholars that he was born during the boycott. And if you do the, the math from there, three years before migration and ten years after migration, that puts him around at 13 years old. And according to many scholars, he wasn't even... He hadn't even reached the age of puberty. He wasn't even at the age of maturity. So when the Prophet ﷺ passes away, he's still a young man and he has this zeal and desire to go and, and, and study the deen. He would go to the Ansar and he would study with them. And he would sit with them one by one. Ikrimah says regarding the knowledge of Ibn Abbas an, that he became a master of the Qur'an. How he became a master of the Qur'an, this is actually a direct dua given to him by the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. But he became such a great master that Ikrima says that Ibn Abbas said regarding himself, I know every word of the Quran, I can give you every context, every meaning, every translation, every tafsir of the Quran, every word of the Quran, illa thalath, but there are three words that I'm stuck on. Ar-Raqeem wa Ghislin wa Hananan. These are three words that I myself, and this is a this is his humbleness, and this also shows us that there is no end to the path of knowledge. Um, so Ibn Abbas an mainly narrates through other companions, bil wasta. When you're reading the actual hadith, generally in hadith collections, it'll say Ibn Abbas narrates that the Prophet wasallam said. It won't say who he's narrating from. Even though Ibn Abbas is actually narrating through another companion. If you open up Sahih al-Bukhari for example, or open up Sahih Muslim, or open up Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Nasai, Ibn Majah, any of these hadith collections. Generally, the narration will say, Ibn Abbas narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said. 90% of the time, he isn't narrating directly from the Prophet ﷺ. Actually, I can even bump that up to 95% of the time. He's actually narrating through a companion. This is called a mursal riwayah. A mursal riwayah is a narration in which the narrator skips the person who he's narrating from. When a companion narrates a mursal riwayah, when a companion of the Prophet ﷺ skips the name of the person who he's narrating from, that narration is still authentic. The reason is because if a sahabi is narrating from someone, who is that person going to be? Another sahabi. And we do not doubt the reliability of the companion that's narrating or the companion that he's narrating from. So this is a technical definition that you can find in the books of Usul al-Hadith, the discussion on marasil, marasil al-Sahaba. But other than that, he narrates from Mu'adh ibn Jabal, Umar ibn Khattab, he narrates from his father Abbas, he narrates from Abdurrahman bin Awf, Abu Sufyan, Sakhar bin Harb, uh, Abu Dhar, Ubay bin Ka'ab, Zayd bin Thabit, and there are so many others that I can continue to name that he narrates from. Where he narrates from many people, Many Sahaba actually narrate from him too. Even though he was younger, because he learned so much, he gained so much knowledge. Later on you see that Anas bin Malik narrates from him, Abu Tufail narrates from him, Abu Umama narrates from him, his brother Kathir ibn Abbas also narrates from him, Urwa bin Zubair narrates from him, Ta'us narrates from him, Sa'id bin Jubair, Mujahid bin Jabal, Qasim bin Muhammad, and the list continues on of people who narrate from them. Mixture of the Sahaba and the Tabi'un. As I mentioned earlier, that he migrated um, after the conquest of Makkah Mukarramah, which gave him a limited, a limited window to be in the company of the Prophet ﷺ. But Ibn Abbas went above and beyond to ensure that he made the most of it. There's a very interesting narration that one day Abdullah ibn Abbas went to his khala, his aunt, Maymuna radiallahu anha, and he said to her, I'd like to spend the night at your house. So Maymuna radiallahu anha, his aunt said, I generally wouldn't mind you coming over, but tonight's not a good night. He said, why? She said, because tonight the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa will be staying at my house. He said, yeah, that's why I wanted to spend the night. You're my door, you're my aunt, so through you I can go. So she said, okay, let me ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa if he's okay with it. 
The Prophet وسلم, said, Oh, Abdullah, he's my cousin. Let him come. He's a young man. He'll come. We'll have a good time together. So Abdullah bin Abbas عن, comes in to sleep over at the house of the Prophet. But what's interesting is that he's not coming to sleep over to have a pillow fight or to have s'mores. He's coming in with a goal. And what's his goal? He wants to study the night of the Prophet. Many people have narrated the day of the Prophet. He wants to tell people what the Prophet's night looked like. And it's a very lengthy narration. He says, we came home, we sat together, we talked, we had a good discussion. And after the Prophet ﷺ then told us all we should go to sleep, when we were lying down, because the room was so small, we all slept together more or less. But not only did we sleep in the same room, he says we actually all slept on one pillow. There was the pillow that was in its length. The Messenger of Allah and Maimunah slept in one direction of the pillow, and I slept in the length of the pillow, like this very long L. You guys understand? He said, I put my head on one edge of the pillow and extended my head all the way. So like he made the long part of the L and the small part of it, the L, the other direction right here. This is where the Prophet ﷺ and Maimunah they lied together. He said, I had my eyes closed, but in reality I was awake. He said, the Prophet ﷺ went to sleep and he describes the sleeping habit of the Prophet ﷺ in that narration. He then says, when the Prophet ﷺ woke up, he exited the home. And when he exited the home, he went for the washroom. By the time the Prophet came back, after he had relieved himself and he was ready to do his wudu, the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ found a bowl of water there, ready for wudu. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Man wada ahada? Who put this water here? So Abdullah bin Abbas and woke up. It was me. So the Prophet ﷺ called him. He said, come here young man. Masahan Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ra'si. The Prophet ﷺ, he wiped his hand, his blessed hand over my head. Wada'ali, and he made dua for me. And he said, Allahumma allimhu ta'wil wa faqihhu fi deen O oh Allah, give him the knowledge of the commentary, the tafsir of the Qur'an. And O oh Allah, give him the knowledge of the depth of this religion. Young man, maybe 11, 12 years old, young kid. You know, no facial hair, you know, what do young kids do at that age? They play soccer, they play Minecraft, they do ajib things. And this young kid, what is he doing? He's giving the special dua. And this is an interesting point to reflect on. If you want, remember this, if you want a dua from someone's heart, sometimes you have to earn it. Your mother will always give you dua, but if you want that special, special dua, you have to go out of your way and find a way to earn that dua. That's why doing khidmah, serving other people, is an amazing way to earn dua. You don't know how much that person is in need of that service. We were once gone for hajj. One brother came to me and said, Shaykh, I went to the haram to do tawaf, but I don't have any energy. So I'm here right now. I read Quran early in the morning, so I did all of my Quran recitation. Uh, I was going to do tawaf, I don't have energy. But I don't want to come back to the hotel and sleep. I want to stay here. What's one ibadah you recommend me to do right now? I said to him, oh, I have a good idea for you. Get a bottle, fill it up with zamzam, get a few plastic cups, stand by the people that are doing tawaf, pour water for them, give them a cup and tell them to make dua for you. I said, you'll get everyone's duas. And since it's after Dohar Salah time, it's really hot there, they'll give you dua from their heart. He said, it's a really random thing to do, but I'll do it. So he got this jug. He got a few cups and he said, I stood in the mataf where they do tawaf. And he said, I kept giving everyone water. And every person I gave water to, I told them, make dua for my mother, make dua for my father, make dua for my siblings, make dua for me. And he said, I was amazed to see the people that I was giving water to, I didn't even ha have to ask them to make a sincere dua because they were already crying. These people were already doing tawaf, they were already in the most sincere zone they can be and they traveled the world to come and do this tawaf. And I asked them, hey, slide my name in your list. And the people were making dua for me as I was serving them water. This is how you earn proper du'as. Through the means of khidmah and serving. Uwais al-Qarani, how did he gain his maqam? It was through the khidmah of his mother. Every one of these companions, they was, it was the, the, the service to the Prophet ﷺ and to those who were around them that got them that special du'a. Now later on we see Abdullah bin Abbas becomes the greatest mufassir of the ummah. Most of the tafsir of the Qur'an goes through the students of Ibn Abbas عن, Ibn Abbas عن, from the Messenger of Allah He becomes a master of the Qur'an. Abdullah bin Abbas عن, was a very beautiful young man. 
His student Ata says, "Ma ra'aytu al-qamar laila arba' arba' ta'ashar illa dhakartu wajh ibn Abbas." He said there wasn't a night. His student Ata says there wasn't a night that I sat and looked at the moon of the fourteenth of the month. Fourteenth of the month is the the full moon. He said there wasn't a night where I sat there looking at the full moon. But when I would look at it, I would immediately remember the face of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu. Ikrima says that when Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu ida marra fi tariq when he would pass by in the pathway, the people would say, "Amarra al misku or marra Ibn Abbas." When Ibn Abbas would walk through the street, the people would say, "Did someone just carry like a whole, uh, 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 like a pot of musk, beautiful fragrance, or did Ibn Abbas just walk past her?" Because he always carried a beautiful scent with him wherever he went. Ibn Qurayb says, who narrates from his father Qurayb, that I saw Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu ya'tammu bi'amamatin sawda. He used to wear a black turban, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. فَيُرْخِي شِبْرًا بَيْنَ كَتْفَيْهِ أَوْ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ He would sometimes let the, 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 the back part of the turban, the part that hangs, go behind, or sometimes he would keep it in the front. Ibn Abbas radiallahu an in the latter part of his life, right before, not too long before he passed away, actually lost his eyesight. And there's an interesting incident to how that actually happened. Imam Tabrani rahmatullahi alayhi narrates in his Al-Kabir from Ibn Abbas radiallahu an that Ibn Abbas radiallahu an says, رَأَيْتُ Jibril marratain." I've seen Jibreel alayhi salam two times. Then one of these times, is actually mentioned not in one hadith collection but narrated by multiple um, scholars of hadith. Imam Dhahabi rahmatullahi alayhi narrates from Maymun bin Bahran who narrates from Abdullah bin Abbas. He says that مَرَرْتُ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ وَعَلَيْهِ ثِيَابٌ بِيذٌ نَقِيَّ One day I passed by the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was wearing these very beautiful white garments. وَهُوَ يُنَاجِي دِحْيَ الْكَلْبِ and the Prophet ﷺ was secretly speaking to a companion whose name was Dihya Kalbi. Now, some of you may know this, others probably not. Dihya Kalbi was a very handsome companion of the Prophet ﷺ. And when Jibreel ﷺ would come to meet the Prophet ﷺ in the form of a human being, he would generally come in his form. So he says here, وَهُوَ يُنَاجِي دِحْيَا الْكَلْبِ Then he says, وَهُوَ Jibril. The person the Prophet was speaking to was actually Jibreel ﷺ. وَأَنَا لَا أَعْلَمْ But I had no idea that that was Jibreel alayhi salam. How am I supposed to know that's an angel? So Jibreel alayhi salam said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, مَنْ هَذَا Who is this young man that's standing there staring at us? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Ibn Ammi, this is my nephew, this is my cousin. So Jibreel alayhi salam said, مَا أَشَدَّ وَسَخَ ثِيَابِهِ Look how dirty his clothes are. You know how kids are, they're always making a mess playing. They don't care about how clean their clothes are. And then he said, أَمَا إِنَّ ذُرِّيَّتَهُ سَتَسُودُ بَعْدَهُ Verily, very soon his children will become leaders. ثُمَّ قَالَ لِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ Later on he says, after that was over, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم came to me and he said to me, Did you see the person who I was talking with? So, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu said, Yes, I did see. You were speaking to that person. Then obviously he finds out it was Jibreel alayhi salam. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم then said to him, أَمَا إِنَّهُ سَيَذْهَبُ بَصَرُكَ if you saw Jibreel alayhi salam with your naked eyes, I fear that you will lose your eyesight. And it was before his passing away that Abdullah ibn Abbas an actually lost his eyesight. And he would say that I remember the day the Prophet wasallam told me when I was a kid after I saw Jibreel alayhi salam with my naked eye that the nur of an angel is such that the, the average human being can't bear it. And for um, Jibreel alayhi salam to be present in Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu to see him in that kayfiyah. Mullah Ali Qari rahmatullahi alayhi um, narrates in his commentary on Mishkat al Masabih that um, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu lost his eyesight fi akhir umri in the last part of his life. He was known for his piety and his ibadah. Ibn Abi Mulaika says that I was once with Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu as we traveled from Makkah Mukarramah to Medina Munawwara. When half of the night passed by, Ibn Abbas an stood up for prayer. And he prayed for half of the night. He prayed salah for half of the night. فَسَأَلَهُ أَيُّوب كَيْفَ كَانَتْ قِرَاءَتُهُ So Ayyub, one of his students, one of his students asked, 
he stood there for half a night reading in salah, praying in salah. Describe his recitation. How was his recitation of the Qur'an? So Ibn Abi Mulaika says, قَرَأَ وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ ذَلِكَ مَا كُنْتَ مِنْهُ تَحِيدٍ Verse number 19 of Surah Qaf. And death has come with its reality, and this is that which you would ignore. ذَلِكَ مَا كُنْتَ مِنْهُ تَحِيدٍ This is that which you would ignore, which you would stay away from. He says, after he read that ayah, he continued to read it and repeat it and read it abundantly and he cried excessively. Meaning someone not only who was a scholar of the Qur'an, who had memorized the Qur'an, who would recite the Qur'an, but when he would read it, it led him to immediate instant reflection. He's reflecting over death as he's reading that ayah which caused him to, to cry and cry and cry. He lived during the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu an, and after that too, he actually was he actually passed away during the period of Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu an. So, Muawiyah radiallahu an one day approached him and asked him, Anta ala millati Ali? Are you from the group of Ali? Because Ali radiallahu an's group and Muawiyah radiallahu an's group had some conflict. So he asked him, Anta ala millati Ali? Are you, on the group, are you with the group of Ali radiallahu an? So Ibn Abbas radiallahu an said, Waqultu la, wa la ala millati Uthman. I am not on the, uh, I'm not with that group or this group. He kept himself in the middle. He said, I'm a hush person. I'm in the middle. Ana ala millati Rasulillah. If you ask me which group I'm with, I'm with the group of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Which is an interesting uh, language to use because obviously he is a companion and he has support for both Sahaba. Uthman radiallahu an, Ali radiallahu an, Muawiyah radiallahu an. But when it comes to politics, he decides to steer clear. That's not his place, not his interest. He is a student of knowledge. He is a scholar of tafsir. His intention is to dedicate his life for seeking knowledge. So what does he say? He says, don't pull me into your petty politics. Leave me alone. I am with the group of the Prophet ﷺ, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. Don't let people drag you into their politics. Don't let them label you as a Democrat or Republican. If you're not interested in politics, don't feel guilt-tripped. There's nothing wrong with that. You choose what you're interested in, and work hard on that. Maybe for you, politics are petty things. Maybe it's petty for you. Maybe for you what's, what matters more is rather than going and engaging in heated um, political debates, maybe what's more important to you is just to be, volunteer at a soup kitchen. Don't let someone guilt trip you because you aren't vocal about your political party. And Ibn Abbas does exactly that. Don't pull me into your slogans. Don't drag me into your debate. I'm going to play my ground, which is that I'm going to continue to be a student of knowledge. And that's what he continued to do. He was a very intelligent man. Very intelligent. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an, during his khilafah would ask Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu an, to sit in the private gatherings. So Umar radiallahu an, had an immediate council, his immediate shura, which consisted of senior companions from the muhajireen and the ansar. These were people that he would make reference to and seek their opinion on critical issues. When Umar radiallahu an, would conduct that gathering, he would always ask for Abdullah bin Abbas to participate. Now if you continue his age, if when the Prophet passed away, he's 13 years old, by the time Umar radiallahu anh becomes Khalifa, he's 15 years old, because Abu Bakr was only Khalifa for two years radiallahu anh. So he's now a 15 year old kid, 16, 17, you know, depending on what part of Umar radiallahu anh's Khalifa this is. And a 16 year old kid is sitting with men like Abdurrahman bin Awf radiallahu anh, you know, senior Sahaba who've been with the Prophet of Allah from more or less the beginning. So some of the Muhajirun, قَدْ وَجَدُوا عَلَىٰ عُمَرْ They became upset with Umar رضي الله عنه فِي إِدْنَائِهِ إِبْنَ عَبَّاسٍ دُونَهُمْ Because he brought Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه so close while not giving others that same opportunity. Some of them actually said to Umar رضي الله عنه that we would like for you to, to have our kids participate in the gathering the way you participate Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه. So Umar رضي الله عنه, he said, أَمَا إِنِّي سَأُرِيكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مِنْهُ مَا تَعْرِفُونَ فَضْلَهُ Today I will show you something that will prove to you why I bring this young man into my gathering. فَسَأَلَهُمْ عَنْ هَذِهِ السُّرَةِ إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ He gathered the companions who were in his immediate circle and he asked them to share their opinions on the surah النَّصْرِ إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ It's a surah consisting of only three verses. Very small surah. فَقَالَ بَعْضُهُمْ أَمَرَ اللَّهُ نَبِيَّهُ إِذَا رَأَ النَّاسِ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا أَنْ يَحْمَدَهُ وَيَسْتَغْفِرَهُ That he asked the companions, what do you think the surah is saying? So each companion said, 
Oh, it's very clear that the surah is saying that when you see people entering into the folds of Islam in large numbers, praise Allah and glorify Him. Very clear, if you read the translation, their interpretation matches the translation. فَقَالَ عُمَرْ يَبْنَ عَبَّاسِ تَكَلَّمْ Umar radiallahu anhu said, O oh son of Abbas, O oh young man, now you tell me what is your opinion on the tafsir of this surah. So he said that this surah is indicating towards the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Atika al maut, the death is coming to you, O Messenger of Allah. So some of the Sahaba asked, Where does it say his death is coming? He said, The Messenger of Allah came to spread Islam. And when people enter into Islam in large scores and large numbers, that means the Prophet has fulfilled his responsibility. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last ayah of this surah is, prepared, is guiding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to a retirement plan. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ This is your retirement plan. Glorify Allah with His praise and repent to Allah. That's what you need to do for the rest of your life. Because the last... Affair, the last thing, you, the thing you should do after you complete your ibadah is istighfar. After we finish our salah, after we finish praying, one of the first things we do is we say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. We're asking Allah for forgiveness in case we made any mistakes while we pray. So he's saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to seek repentance from Allah after now his ibadah, his responsibility <coughs> as a messenger has come to an end. And that's when the other companions realize how great his rank was. His father Abbas then came to him and said to him, O oh my son, Ya Bunayya, inna umara, inna umara yudnika. He said, My son, Umar is bringing you very close to him. He's giving you a special position that other people don't get. Fahfad anni thalathan. So let me give you three pieces of advice. If you follow these three pieces of advice, Umar radiallahu anhu will always keep you under his wing. First thing, never expose a secret that you hear in that gathering. Anything you hear, discretion. Learn al majalis bil amana. Gatherings are with trust. If someone tells you something in a private gathering, you do not have the right to expose that to other people. The second thing he says, don't ever backbite anyone in front of him. Because if you backbite someone in front of another person, what does that person know about you? That you backbite. And very soon, their name is going to be mentioned in front of someone else. So he said, don't ever backbite in front of Anyone in front of Umar radiallahu anhu because he will lose trust in you. And the third thing he says, and don't ever let him find you lying. Be honest. Be truthful. These are all three very simple advices. Advice that actually goes to any Muslim, any human being. But the reason why this is so important is because a father is giving this advice to a young child who has a great bright future in front of him. Abu al-Wa'il says that I once came for Hajj and I heard Ibn Abbas giving a khutbah, giving a lecture, and he was doing tafsir of the verses of Surah An-Nur. فَجَعَلَ يَقْرَأُ وَيُفَسِّرُ He would read an ayah and he would commentate. So Abu al-Wa'il says, مَا رَأَيْتُ وَلَا سَمِعْتُ كَلَامَ رَجُلٍ مِثْلَ هَذَا لَوْ سَمِعَتْهُ فَارِسَ وَالرُّومُ وَالتُرْكُ لَأَسْلَمَتْ He said he was so eloquent in explaining the ayat of the Qur'an, so clear, but if the Romans and the Persian and the Turks were to hear his recitation and his explanation, they would accept Islam. Ibn Abbas passed away in the city of Ta'if. There's a lot of context to this. He lived in Basra. Then after that, he moved to Makkah Mukarramah. Abdullah bin Zubayr told him, take bay'ah out of my hands. And Ibn Abbas decided not to take bay'ah. And the reason was because he didn't want to get involved in the politics. Politics were getting heated, things were getting really bad. So he then left uh, Makkah Mukarramah and settled down in Ta'if. And it was in Ta'if while he was there that he actually passed away. Imam Dhahabi rahmatullahi alayhi quotes, he says that when Ibn Abbas an passed away in Ta'if and his body was being taken to, for burial, لَمَّا خَرَجُوا بِنَعْشِهِ جَاءَ طَيْرٌ عَظِيمٌ أَبْيَضٌ حَتَّى خَالَتَ أَكْفَانَهُ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرَوْهُ That a, a, a white bird came from a direction and entered into his kafan, entered into his shroud. And no one saw that bird exiting. 
He just went inside. It was a miracle that happened before he passed away. And this incident, by the way, isn't only narrated by Imam Dhabi, it's narrated by many biographers. They say that we saw this, we saw this, we saw this miracle before he passed away. Um, Sa'id narrates, مَاتَ ابْنِ عَبَّاسِ بِالطَّائِفِ فَجَاءَ طَائِرٌ لَمْ يُرَى عَلَىٰ خِلْقَتِهِ فَدَخَلَ نَعْشَهُ ثُمَّ لَمْ يُرَى خَارِجًا مِنْهُ فَلَمَّا دُفِنَتْ تُلِيَتْ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ عَلَىٰ الشَّفِيرِ الْقَبْرِ لَا يُدْرَى مَنْ تَلَاهَا يَا أَيَّتُهَا النَّفْسُ الْمُطْمَئِنَّةِ ارْجِعِي إِلَىٰ رَبِّكِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيَةً That when we buried Ibn Abbas عن, after we finished burying him, we heard this ayah of the Qur'an being recited, and nobody knew who recited it. It was as if it was a voice from the unseen reciting it. Again, Imam Dhahabi narrates this too. And the ayah of the Qur'an was of Surah Fajr, verse number 27 and 28. Ya ila Ibn Abbas an passed away in the year 68 after Hijrah. Which means how old was he when he passed away? Let's see if someone can do the math quickly. 71, very good. He was born three years before Hijrah, passed away 68 years after Hijrah which makes him 71 years old when he passed away. As I mentioned earlier, he narrates 1,660 ahadith, alfun wa sittun wa mi'atin wa sittuna hadithan, out of which 75 ahadith are found in Bukhari and Muslim. And Bukhari narrates 120 ahadith, and Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi alone narrates 9 ahadith. Now let's come to the hadith. This hadith we study from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. It is narrated through multiple chains. However, where it is narrated by his son Ali, it's narrated by Ikrimah, who was his servant, Ata bin Abi Rabah, Amr bin Dinar. There are many people who narrate it. But all of those narrations ultimately have weakness in them. All of those narrations all of them have narration, have weakness. This narration that Imam Tirmidhi rahmatullahi alayhi is bringing is from Hanash as sanani Imam Tirmidhi after narrating it, he says, Hasanun Sahih, meaning it's a good narration and it's an authentic narration. So this is the narration that we're going to use for today's class that Imam, Tirmidhi, that Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi brings in his 40 hadith collection. The scholars, they say that this hadith is a hadith that consists of great principles of the deen, of the religion. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, rahimahullah, regarding this hadith says, as Mullah Ali Qari quotes in his Mishkat al-Musabih, يَنْبَغِي لِكُلِّ مُؤْمِنٍ أَنْ يَجْعَلَ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ مِرْآةَ قَلْبِهِ It is important that every believer makes this hadith a mirror for his heart. Reflect this hadith against your heart and ask yourself, how far am I from these words of the Prophet ﷺ, this advice he gave to a young man? فَيَعْمَلُ بِهِ فِي جَمِيعِ حَرَكَاتِهِ وَسَكَنَاتِهِ حَتَّى يَسْلَمَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَيَجِدُ الْعِزَّةِ فِيهَا بِرَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى And he says, continue to implement and bring this hadith into your life. So ultimately you can save yourself from any difficulty in this world and in the hereafter and you are honored with izzah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with true honor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Rajab al-Hambali, um, in his Jami' al-Ulum al-Hikam, he says, Hatta qala ba'd al-ulama, that some scholars said regarding this hadith, tadabbartu hadha al-hadith, fa'adhashani wa kittu atish, fawa'asafa min al-jahli bi hadha al-hadith, wa qillat al-tafahum li ma'anahu. That some scholars, they say, that we reflected on this hadith, and we reflected so so much on this hadith that this, the scholar says that my head started hurting and I almost kind of like fainted. I got lightheaded. The how deep this hadith was. The more I thought about it, the more deeper I went, the more deeper I went, the more deeper I went. Then he says, فَوَا أَسَفَا مِنَ الْجَهْلِ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ How much regret and remorse is for that person who was unaware of this particular hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. وَقِلَّةَ التَّفَاهُمْ لِمَعْنَاهُ and for the one who read the hadith, but, but unfortunately was, un, was unable to actually reflect over the meanings of this hadith. This hadith teaches us proper belief in qadr. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has predetermined for us. And understanding and having a strong belief in qadr builds a foundation that will guide you through any calamity and difficulty in life. Building a proper foundation in qadr is not necessarily a deep 
an intellectual understanding of Qadr, even though that has its place and it's very important. Having a proper understanding of Qadr is ultimately trusting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always do what's best for you. Allah Azza wa Jal has mercy for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you more than your own mother loves you. So do good deeds and you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's fadl. You will find the favor of Allah, you will find the mercy of Allah inshaAllah. Knowing that wherever you are in your life, no matter what struggle you're facing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully aware that you're there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unaware of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of the struggle you're facing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware that you have the ability to get through the struggle even though you don't believe it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to use that struggle as an opportunity to rise in your spirituality. This is what this hadith is teaching. This young man who's going to face many struggles in life. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the whole world wants to harm you but Allah has written otherwise, they can never harm you. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest lesson of taqdeer, of predestination, is tawakkul. Reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the captain of my ship was untrained, then I should be worried. Then I should be terrified. Oh my God, what's going to happen to the ship? But if the captain of the ship is the creator of the ship, is the one who has passion and love for every person on board, is the most skilled uh, pilot or um, sailor in the world, the most skilled captain, then why should I be afraid? I should be confident. And human beings still have flaws and we can still make mistakes. What about the guidance of Allah Azza wa Jal? The, the taqdeer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this hadith has many lessons within it. One very beautiful lesson that I like to reflect over when I read this hadith is how Ibn Abbas an and the Prophet wasallam are on one animal together and they're riding and while they're riding the Prophet wasallam utilizes that time and starts educating him. Usually when you're driving in your car and your child's in the passenger seat, what do parents usually do? They get on their phone, they chat and let the kids play, fo- play games on their phone. Yes or no? Or they, these days they have TVs in the car. So kids start watching their TV and the parents, they drive. There's no talking. When the truth is that you shouldn't even waste that moment. You should talk with your kids. Have conversations with them. You know, I've, I've noticed one thing very beneficial. That when I'm in the car with my kids, I dedicate my time communicating with them. I try to avoid using the phone, avoid listening to the radio, avoid this, that, and the other. Communicate with them, talk with them. Because I'm not going anywhere, they're not going anywhere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lock us into a box for a reason. And the reason why we're locked in together and they have child safety at the back, they're not getting out until I want them to. We need to talk, let's communicate, let's, let's advise one another. Let me listen from them what their challenges are. The other day I was, we, we were in the car, for some reason the thought came to my mind, let me ask my kids a question. By the way, they're only two, six and seven. So I asked them a question, I said, do you ever feel lonely? So my kids, one of them said, both of them, the two older ones said yes, the younger one doesn't even know what lonely means. The two older ones, the elder ones, they said, yes, we feel lonely. I asked the oldest one, when do you feel lonely? He said, Abba, when you tell me to go upstairs to go to sleep, while I'm climbing up the stairs, I feel lonely. I'm like, okay. We'll work on that. I asked the second one, when do you feel lonely? And his, his response was very interesting. He said to me, Abba, I feel lonely when I'm at school and in the break, nobody comes and plays with me. And I realized that subhanAllah, he's already feeling this loneliness. So I have to channel this energy. If I don't channel this energy, if I don't channel his thoughts right now, what will happen is that this kid will think that people are abandoning me because I'm weird. So rather than letting him think negative of himself and thinking negative of his surroundings, how about I plant a positive thought in his mind? So I said to my son, when I was young, I used to listen to this nasheed. Do you mind if I play it? So I played this nasheed. And the nasheed was about being in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he loved it so much. After that day, he sits in the car and he sings that nasheed about always being in the presence of Allah. And he told me, he said, I asked him the other day, I said, do you feel lonely at school? He said, I am lonely sometimes when my friends don't play with me, but I always remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with me. You know, small little seeds, you plant them from a young age. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ is doing with this young kid. He's having a conversation with him, he's talking with him. Heart to heart, open conversation. The scholars also deduce from this hadith, as you'll find in the commentaries on the Arba'in, 
جواز الإرداف على الدابة the permissibility of having more than one person on an animal because how much load can an animal actually carry so the scholars they say if the animal is strong and the second passenger is small like Ibn Abbas was a young kid then there is permission to have multiple people Ibn Manda he has a, a publication on this and he lists the people who rode alongside the Prophet ﷺ on the same animal including them is Mu'adh ibn Jabal Hassan radiallahu anhu Hussein radiallahu anhu and many others as well now when the Prophet ﷺ is giving advice to this young man, look at the way the Prophet ﷺ starts off. He says to him, Ya ghulam, O oh young child, O oh young child. In one narration he said, Ya ghulain, which is a young child, even younger, even smaller. Tazgheed, like ghulain is a small, small child. Like, you know, oh young man, he's trying to, point to the idea that you're still young, your life is starting right now. So let me plant some seeds in your heart that will guide you through the rest of your life. The Prophet ﷺ catches his attention, tanbih, and has him focus, يَحْتَحْذِرُ قَلْبَهُ And the Prophet ﷺ, after saying, Ya Ghulam, and making sure he's paying attention, then the Prophet ﷺ, he makes him interested in what the Prophet ﷺ is about to say. And how he does that is that the Prophet ﷺ doesn't overwhelm him with a lengthy two-hour speech. He says, "Inni u'allimuka kalimat." What does that mean? I'm going to teach you a few words. That's it, right? I'm going to teach you something very small. Kalima. Kalima is like a word. That's it. Kalima can either be ism, fail, or harf if you read in nahu, right? So it's one word. He said, "I'm going to teach you a few words. Pay attention." The Prophet ﷺ says this to gather his attention and to make sure he's paying attention so that he finds it easy to learn from the Prophet ﷺ. Now, what does the Prophet ﷺ say? Now, the advice starts. Allah. Be mindful of Allah. Yahfadka. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be mindful of you. Protect Allah. Yahfadillah. What does it mean to protect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The truth is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of anyone's protection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hafidh. He is the protector. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of anyone's protection because no one can harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does it mean when he says, Ihfadillah, be mindful of Allah. So the scholars of hadith, while um, commentating on this, they say, what this means is, احفظ حدوده وحقوقه وأوامره ونواهيه That protect Allah meaning be mindful of the limits of Allah, the rights of Allah, the commands of Allah, and the prohibitions of Allah. That's why when I translate احفظ الله rather than saying protection, I like to use the word mindful. Be mindful of the rights of Allah. Be mindful of the commands of Allah. Be mindful of the prohibitions of Allah. And you'll find in the Qur'an, that the one who is mindful of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has referred to that person in the Qur'an as a hafidh, as a protector. As Allah says in the Qur'an, هذا ما توعدون لكل أواب حفيظ من خشي الرحمن بالغيب وجاء بقلب منيب Surah Qaf 32-33 And then we also find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an says, حَافِظُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ Which translates as, be punctual, be particular, be mindful of your prayers. وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى Surah Baqarah 2.38 And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ma'arij says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَى صَلَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ Those who are punctual on their prayer, those who are mindful of their prayer. So when you are mindful of the commandments of Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal will be mindful of you. يحفظ. What does it mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you? What does that even mean? Ibn Rajab al-Hambali says that this will manifest itself in two ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's um, protection will manifest itself in two ways. The first thing he says is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect your children, will protect your family members, will protect your wealth. Meaning, physically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect everything that's connected to you. A 
a pious man once saw an old, weak man walking past. So people asked him, look how weak he is, look how old he is, look how diseased this man is. So the scholar said, إِنَّ هَذَا ضَعِيفٌ ذَيَّعَ اللَّهَ فِي صِغْرِهِ فَذَيَّعَهُ اللَّهُ فِي كِبْرِهِ He wasted the command of Allah when he was young, Allah wasted him now that he's old. Had he been mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he was young, Allah azza wa jal would have preserved him all the way through in his life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Kahf says, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا That Musa and Khadr protected um, uh, children because their parents were pious people. They weren't necessarily pious. The Qur'an doesn't say they were pious. The Qur'an says their parents were pious. If you are mindful of the commandments of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not only take care of you, but Allah, Allah azza wa jalla will take care of your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren for many generations to come because of one person's piety. This last... Um, Weekend, I was in the Bay Area. I went there for a fundraiser. And there was an imam who was speaking before me. And he said something very beautiful. This imam said that I was speaking to my father. And his father is also a great scholar. Someone who I have a lot of respect for. So this friend of mine, Imam Tahir, said that I was speaking with my father. And his father, Maulana Anwar, said to, his, to Imam Tahir, that you know your mother's grandmother, your mother's grandmother, she used to make a lot of dua. Everyone in the village used to say regarding her that after 3 o'clock at night she would be awake doing the Hajjud Salah, making dua to Allah, lengthy hours every night. And today when you look at her children, or her grandkids, they're spread through the world very, very wealthy. So Mawana Anwar then tells his son, Imam Tahir, that I want you to know that those children are not wealthy because of their own doing, they're wealthy because of the dua of their great-grandmother. She made a lot of dua for them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. Otherwise, when I look at them, they didn't have any special skill set. They weren't anything special. They weren't anything unique. Their grandmother was that person. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا الصَّالِحَ That when a person is mindful of Allah, Allah Azza wa Jalla protects them and their progeny. And the second way of protection comes through protecting them spiritually. حِفْظُ اللَّهِ لِلْعَبْدِ فِي دِينِهِ وَإِمَانِهِ Allah Azza wa Jalla will protect him in his deen. And Allah Azza wa Jalla will protect him in his faith. Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali says, قَالَ بَعْضُ السَّلَفِ إِذَا حَضَرُ الرَّجُلُ الْمَوْتِ يُقَالُ لِلْمَلَكِ شَمَّ رَأْسَهُ قَالَ أَجِدْ فِي رَأْسِهِ الْقُرْآنِ قَالَ شَمَّ قَلْبَهُ قَالَ أَجِدْ فِي قَلْبِهِ الصِّيَامِ قَالَ شَمَّ قَدَمَيْهِ قَالَ أَجِدْ فِي قَدَمَيْهِ الْقِيَامِ قَالَ حَفِظَ نَفْسَهُ فَحَفِظَهُ اللَّهِ That when a person is dying, the angel who comes to receive his soul is told that smell his head. And the angel sniffs his head and says, I can smell the Qur'an in it. The angel is then told, smell his heart. He smells his heart and says, I can smell fasting in his heart. That this person used to fast a lot. He is then told, smell his feet. And the angel says, I smell that this person spent lengthy hours standing in front of Allah in prayer. So then, he is told, hafidha nafsahu, that he protected himself. Today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect him. He was mindful of Allah, and today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be mindful. One of our mashayikh used to say that when a person has a spiritual crisis, that person should know that their spiritual crisis today is because of their discontinuation of good deeds. Because Allah says, Be mindful of Allah, Allah will protect you. But if you're spiritually spiraling, that means somewhere earlier on, you stopped your nawafil, you stopped your dhikr, you stopped your sunan, you stopped praying, you stopped fasting, your connection with the Qur'an became weak. And go back to people who left Islam or people who became weak in their religion, no matter which religion it is in the world. You go to them and you'll find that they became weak in their, spirit, in their spirituality when they, when they stepped away from being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one narration it says, Tajidhu amamak, that you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of you. What does that mean? Some scholars they say, sorry, in this very same narration, in some narration it says Tajidhu amamak, and in this narration it says Tajidhu tujahak, meaning you'll find Allah in front of you. The Prophet says, Be mindful of Allah, Allah will be mindful of you. Then he says, Be mindful of Allah again, and you will find Allah in front of you. The scholars they say when a person is mindful of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of that person's affairs. 
But if he continues to be mindful of Allah, meaning in his thoughts, he's doing dhikr all the time, in his heart, he is completely sincere for Allah, every element of his life becomes about Allah, then not only will Allah be mindful of him, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be at that servant's service. As, a, as another hadith says, I will become the eyes with which he sees, the hand with which he touches, the tongue with which he speaks, the feet with which he walks. You know that narration? So it's as if the two combine together, that he will get not only... Uh, the protection of Allah, but the VIP, extra treatment of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah Azza wa Jalla will take care of all of the affairs. In one narration, as, Imam, as we covered earlier on, in this same text, actually before I cover that, Qatada, he says, مَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَكُنْ مَعَهُ وَمَن يَكُنِ اللَّهُ مَعَهُ فَمَعَهُ الْفِئَةَ أَلَّتِي لَا تُغْلَبْ وَالْحَارِسْ أَلَّذِي لَا يَنَامْ وَالْهَادِي أَلَّذِي لَا يَظِلْ Whoever is mindful of Allah, whoever is conscious of Allah, Allah will be with that person. And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with, with that person is a group that can never be overcome. With that person is a power that will never sleep. With that person is a guide that will never be misguided. That's what you have with you when you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with you. Then the hadith continues on. تَعَرَّفْ إِلَى اللَّهِ فِي الرَّخَاءِ يَعْرِفْكَ فِي الشِّدَّةِ that be mindful of Allah in your times of ease and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of your affairs in your difficult times. What does it mean to know Allah? Ta'arraf, to have ma'rifah. What does it mean to know Allah? So the scholars they say, فَمَعْرِفَةُ الْعَبْدِ لِرَبِّهِ نَوْعَانِ There are two degrees of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first degree of knowing Allah is تَصْدِيق بِالْجِنَان إِقْرَارْ bil-lisan. To believe in your heart and to attest with your tongue. Which is what we call basic iman. Believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Allahu waliyyu alladheena amanu. This is ma'rifa amma. Allah is a friend of those who believe in Him. So you've taken a step towards Allah to believe in Him. He is one God alone. No kids, no parents. Isa alayhi salam, Jesus was a prophet of Allah. An honorable, great prophet of Allah. Prophet of Allah that is mentioned in the Quran repeatedly. But ultimately, as Muslims, we believe he was a prophet of Allah. Just as Muhammad ﷺ was a prophet of Allah. Musa ﷺ, Moses was a prophet of Allah. Isa ﷺ was also a prophet of Allah. By having sound belief, when a person establishes sound belief, they automatically gain what we call ma'rifa amma or wilaya amma. A general closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then athani ma'rifatun khasa. The second is a special knowing of Allah. Or a special connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. تَقْضَضِي مَيْلَ الْقَلْبِ إِلَى اللَّهِ بِالْكُلِّيَةِ This is for a person's heart to, to come towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely. In every element, in every aspect, your heart is engaged in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahmad bin Asim Al-Antaqi He said, أُحِبُّ أَلَّا أَمُوتَ حَتَّى أَعْرِفَ مَوْلَايَ وَلَيْسَ مَعْرِفَتُهُ إِقْرَارَ بِهِ وَلَكِنَّ الْمَعْرِفَةَ إِذَا عَرَفْتُهُ إِسْتَحْيَيْتُ مِنْ He said, I wish I die before I truly recognize my Lord. Then he said, recognizing Allah isn't saying with your tongue that I believe in Allah. Recognizing Allah is for your heart to reach a state that you are shameful for your actions because you are always in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِسْتَحْيَيْتُ مِنْ Some scholars, they say that they are people who are the masakeen of the dunya. Masakeen wa ahlid dunya. Kharaju minha wa ma daqu atya wa ma fiha. There are some people who are so poor that they leave this world without tasting the most pleasurable thing to taste in the world. So the scholar was asked, Qila lahu wa ma huwa? What is the most pleasurable thing that a person can taste in the world? Qala ma'rifatullahi azza wa jal. The most pleasurable thing a person can taste in the world is the ma'rifah of Allah. To know your Lord, to know your Creator. Once you've gained that, then you become a wealthy person. But if you take everything else from the world and you haven't recognized your own Lord, then you've taken nothing from the world. But if you've only taken the ma'rifah of Allah from this world, and I invite you to this, spend a moment crying in the love of Allah and you will realize that day that you have freed yourself from you. You have freed yourself from shaitan. You freed yourself of all the distractions. The day you can cry in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was a friend of mine who did hajj with me one year. 
And it's a long story, but just to summarize it, he said, I went to, we were at Hajj one night, he said, I woke up in the middle of the night, I didn't know what to do, so I went to the Haram, the Grand Mosque. When I went to the Grand Mosque in Makkah Mukarramah, he said, I stood in front of the Kaaba, and everyone around me was crying and making dua, and here I was, six foot tall, not knowing how to even call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I had become a master in everything, but I was a failure when it came to even asking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, my weak state of not even being able to ask from Allah put me in humiliation. I was humiliated of myself that this was my connection with Allah. I had built everything, but I had no relationship with Allah azza wa jal. He said, I stood there and I cried and cried and cried until Fajr Salah, until the Adhan was called. And I asked him, while you stood there crying, did you pray to Allah? He said, yes, I made one dua to Allah all night. I said, what dua did you make? He said, the dua that I made to Allah was, Ya Allah, it's taken me so many years to cry in your love. Now that I've started, never let me stop ever again. I just want to cry and cry and cry. Usually when you think of crying, you think of a dark, painful feeling of the heart, a heavy feel. But when you cry in the love of Allah, it's not dark. It's very beautiful actually, it's very enlightening. And there's no heavy feeling, it's as if you've lifted all the weight off your heart. When you can stand in front of Allah and raise your hand and say, Ya Allah, this is my situation. Oh Allah, this is my problem. Ilahi, la tu'adhibni fa inni muqirrum billadhi qad kana minni famali hilatun illa rajai bi'afwika in afawta wa husnu dhanni as Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, he cried in front of the Kaaba and he made this dua. Oh my Lord, don't punish me. Ilahi la tu'adhibni. Imam Shafi'i. Oh my Lord, don't punish me. Fa'inni muqirrum billadhi qad kana minni because I admit to all of my wrongdoings. Famali hilatun illa rajai. The only hope I have right now is my hope in you, O oh Allah. Bi'afwika in afawta wa husnu dhanni. O oh Allah, forgive me if you can forgive me, if you will to forgive me. Because I have good thought of you. Then Imam Shafi'i said, People think, that's Imam Shafi'i. Look how great of a scholar he is. Look what his rank must be. But oh Allah, I am the most wicked of human beings unless you forgive me. You cry to Allah. You make dua to Allah. That's where your, that's where your heart should be. And that's where the Prophet ﷺ is leading Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he's saying to him, call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any fear at all. Without any fear at all. And when a person makes dua to Allah in times of ease, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept that person and come to that person in his difficulty. Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali says, Lamma da'a fi batin al when Yunus alayhi salam called on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he was in the belly of this whale, qalat al-malaika, ya rabbi hadha sawtun ma'roofun, Oh Allah, this is a voice that we recognize because Yunus alayhi salam always made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah azza wa jal said, Ama ta'rifuna dhalik? Wa man hu? Do you know who that is? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Hada abdi Yunus. This is my servant Yunus. And they said, angels said, Abduka Yunus alladhi lam yazal yurfa lahu amalun mutaqabbalun wa da'batun mustajaba. Is this that Yunus who always made dua to you and always called on you and you always accepted his prayer? Allah azza wa jal said, Naam, yes. قالوا يا ربي أفلا ترحم ما كان يصنع في الرخاء فتنجيه من البلاء. Oh Allah, you had mercy upon him in his days of ease. Now show mercy upon him in his days of difficulty too. It's not that you can't call on Allah in your difficult days if you didn't call on Allah in your days of ease. But when a person remembers you when things are going good for them, then they remember you when things are going bad for them. It has a very different touch to it. It has a different meaning in itself. That person's love is a very genuine, very special love. The Haq, um, who is a famous uh, Mufassir, he says that Yunus salam always remembered Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spared him of the punishment. On the other hand, you have Fir'aun who never remembered Allah, but at the time of his death, and Allah punished him. Fir'aun never remembered Allah in his life. But at the time of his death, when the difficulty hit him, he started remembering Allah. But for him, death was there. And there's no repentance once death is in front of you. You can repent to Allah until you see death. But once you experience death, then at that point, you aren't repenting to Allah because you believe in Him. You're repenting to Allah because you've seen the hereafter. You've seen the next world. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in the Quran, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Oh Allah, to you alone we ask and to you alone we worship. And I'll come to that actually asking Allah. Just one more point regarding being mindful of Allah in your, in your good days and Allah will take care of you in your difficult days. Abdul Rahman al-Sulami, Abu Abdul Rahman al-Sulami, before he passed away he said, كَيْفَ لَا أَرْجُوا رَبِّي وَقَدْ سُمْتُ لَهُ ثَمَانِينَ رَمَضَانِ People said to him before he was dying, what's going to happen to you? What's going to happen to you? He said, don't worry about me. My Lord is going to have mercy upon me because I fasted for 80 Ramadan in my life. And one Laylat al-Qadr is enough, I fasted for 80 Ramadan. You think I have, I have any bad thought of my Allah that my Allah is going to waste me? I remembered Allah in good days and the worst day of a human being or the most difficult day is your death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to abandon me in my most difficult day. Similarly, Abu Bakr bin Ayyash, he was dying and his son was by his bed and he was crying and crying and crying. So Abu Bakr bin Ayyash said to him, why are you crying? He said, oh my father, I'm worried what's going to happen to you when you go to the grave, what's going to happen to you in the hereafter when you stand in front of Allah. So he said to his son, أَتَرَ اللَّهَ يُذَيُّعُ لِأَبِيكَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً يَخْتِمُ الْقُرْآنَ كُلَّ لَيْلَةٍ do you think your Allah is going to waste your father when your father completed the entire recitation of the Qur'an every night for 40 years? Do you think Allah is going to waste me? This was his husnul dhan billah. And it wasn't just a false good thought, it was a good thought built on good actions. Right? This is what it means here. Remember Allah in good times and Allah Azza will take care of you in difficult times. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he educates this young man, إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ only ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because everyone else in this world is a sabab, they are a means. Every human being is under the will of Allah just as you are under the will of Allah. If you need assistance, how about turn to the one whose will applies to you and them? Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do for you, you can ask from Him directly, He'll give it to you. That's why the Quran says very clearly, they were a group of companions, they, they, they differed in opinion. That when we make dua, should we make dua out loud or silently? Anunaji rabbuna, am, what is that? Aqaribun rabbuna fanunajihi, am ba'idun fanunadihi. Those are the words of the hadith. That is our Lord close to us, O Messenger of Allah, that we should secretly call out to Him? Or is our Lord out far away that we need to scream and shout when we're calling out to our Lord? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed an ayah in response to this question of the companions. إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my servants ask regarding me, tell them your Lord is not far, your Lord is very close to you. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دعان. Anyone who calls on to Allah, their calling will be accepted by Allah. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ You ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of my favorite poems, لا تسألن بني آدم حاجة وسل الذي أبوابه لا تحجة الله يغضب إن تركت سؤاله وبني آدم حين يسأل يغضب That do not ask the, sh- the children of Adam, other human beings for favors. Don't ask them for anything. However, if you have to ask someone, ask the one whose door is never closed. Whose door is never closed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was one scholar Someone came to him and said, I've been making dua to Allah and my dua isn't being accepted. My prayer isn't being accepted. So that scholar said, keep knocking on that door until it opens. What did that scholar say to this person? Keep knocking on that door until that door opens. Rabi'a Adawiyah, she heard this. She became angry. She said, may Allah forgive that scholar. He claims Allah's door is closed. Allah's door isn't closed, it's always open. She checked him right away. وَسَلِ الَّذِي أَبْوَابُهُ لَا تُحْجَبُ Go and ask the Allah whose doors never close at all. Allah يَغْضَبْ إِن تَرَكْتَ سُؤَالَهُ Allah will get angry if you stop asking Him. And if you ask human beings, they get angry at you. If you ask them, they get angry at you. Allah gets angry if you stop asking Him. So the logical conclusion is, keep asking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars, they say that when you ask from other people, you put yourself in a position where you give them the chance to reject you. They can turn you down. Why go to someone who may turn you down when you can ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
who will never ever turn you down. Ta'us said this to Ata. When Ibrahim a.s. was loaded into the catapult and shot, fired into the fire, when he was in the air, mid-air, about to land in the fire, Ibn Kathir alayhi, narrates in his tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya, that Jibir a.s. came to him and asked him, وَهُوَ فِي الْهَوَى While he was still in the air, like on his way into the fire, أَلَكَ حَاجَةٌ that, Is there anything I can do from you? Now imagine Ibrahim a.s. His clothes have just been stripped off his body. He's been loaded into a catapult. His whole family saw him being launched and he's on his way into the fire, Prophet Abraham. And Angel Jibreel says to him, that, is there anything I can do for you? Alaka hajatun, anything I can help you with? So Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Ama ilayka fala. As for you, I don't have any need from you. Ama ilallah fabala. And as for it goes, do I need anything from Allah? I need everything from Allah. From you, you're a creation. I don't need anything from you. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to help me, Allah Azza wa Jal knows my situation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then made the fire that was burning cool on his body. قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْضًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would always tell his companions, ask from Allah, ask from Allah. And one of the best things you can ask from Allah is the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's interesting, today earlier on in class we were talking about the fadl and adal of Allah. And I came across this ayah, and it's so beautiful. Surah Nisa, verse number 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِ Ask Allah for His fadl, His favor. Because without that favor, no person can go to Jannah. You need that mercy, you need that favor of Allah. So ask Allah, Ya Allah, shower me with your favor. Ibn Masood narrates from the Prophet ﷺ, سَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ أَنْ يُسْأَلْ that ask Allah for his favor because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes to be asked. Allah loves it when people ask him. Then after that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells a companion, Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, be patient with what Allah has destined for you. This is the summary of what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. He says it in a more, in a different language. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that if the world gathered against you to harm you, they can't harm you unless Allah allows it. And if the world gathered together to harm you, to benefit you, they can't benefit you until Allah allows it. So the conclusion is, the only way you can be helped or you can be harmed is if it's by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's teaching him one-on-one qadr, one-on-one destination, what's your destiny, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has predestined for you. He's teaching him one-on-one, introducing him to taqdeer. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is ultimately teaching him, be patient with what Allah has written for you. Um, there's a lot that can be discussed under this issue. Mullah Ali Al-Qari rahimahullah ta'ala under the commentary of this hadith, he says that Allah Azza wa says in the Qur'an regarding taqdeer, يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتْ يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can erase whatever He wishes and establish and make firm whatever He wishes. Which now teaches us that as far as our predestination goes, taqdeer is of two types. Taqdeer mubram, that which cannot be erased. And taqdeer mu'allam, a mu'allaq, that which can be erased, that which can change. There are certain elements of your destiny, your life, which you are in control in. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in yourself the ability to make choices between right and wrong. Allah azza wa jal created you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you ikhtiyar. He gave you an opportunity to choose between what's right and wrong. So know that whatever Allah has written will come to you, but ultimately in the process of that coming to you, don't make the wrong decisions and don't be hasty. Allah has written something for you. Now through your actions you may be hasty and you may botch up the pathway that's supposed to lead to a very beautiful blessing that Allah has kept for you at the end of that tunnel. So be very careful and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what He's written for you will come to you. Your job is to be patient, whether it's in relation to your school grades, whether it's in relation to your marriage or your work or anything. Know that what Allah has written for you is there for you. Your job is to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Read your istikhara regularly. That's exactly what we're saying in istikhara. We say, Ya Allah, whatever is good for me, give it to me. It's a, it's a prayer that we read when we are in need to make a decision. And ultimately, do what you think is best as guided by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told you to do, you continue to do that. That's your goal. Your job is to do good deeds. Right? 
Your job is to do good deeds. I always give this example that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was promised paradise by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam publicly, not once but multiple times. True or false? True or false? Absolutely true. But does he stop doing his good deeds? He doesn't stop. He keeps doing them because he knows the promise of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he will go to Jannah is actually because of the good deeds that he does. It's actually because of those good deeds. He needs to continue doing those good deeds. And the good deeds are what Allah asked him to do. Therefore, if he wants to please Allah, he needs to continue doing that. Now, there are obviously different levels of um, believing in rada and the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have listed them all down, but unfortunately, due to our constraint in time, I'm going to um, skip all of those. And just know that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you, um, Allah is aware of the situation you're in. Just be patient and trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِذَا حَبَّ قَوْمًا إِبْتَلَاهُمْ When Allah loves a person or loves a group, when Allah loves a nation, Allah will test them. فَمَنْ رَضِيَ فَلَهُ الرِّضَى Whoever is pleased with Allah testing him or her, Allah will, will in return give that person his pleasure. فَمَنْ سَخِتَ And whoever becomes angry, Ya Allah, why did you punish me? فَلَهُ السَّخْتَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then in return be angry at that person too. The Prophet ﷺ would make a dua, a very beautiful dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka rida ba'd al qada. Oh Allah, allow me to be pleased with whatever you've destined for me. Oh Allah, allow me to be pleased with what you've destined for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ That Allah will test you in your life. وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ However, give glad tidings to those that are patient. Don't give up too quickly. The people around you may give up. It may feel long. The tunnel may feel very dark and long. Maybe you feel like it's never coming to and it's never going to come to an end. But just be patient. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةً Those people who when afflicted with a calamity, قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهُ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ They say that we belong to Allah and to Allah we will return. أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمًا Upon those people Allah's mercy descends. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ And those are the people that are truly guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then moving forward with the hadith, just quickly breezing through the rest of it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the companions, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ النَّصْرَ مَعَ الصَّبْرِ Know that Allah's help will come if you are patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran, Surah Baqarah verse number 249, الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُ اللَّهِ كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ That those who are patient will always find the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, how many times has it happened that a small group of people have defeated a large group of people? The odds were against them, but they won. Because Allah is always the people that are patient. You may not be the best parent. You may not be the most intellectual, most well-read parent out there. There are some people who've read tons of books on parenting. And then there are some who haven't read much. But if you're patient, if you make dua to Allah, if you try to do your best, do what's in your ability. Obviously, educating yourself is a part of that, but you don't have to read 20 books in it. You do what's in your ability. Allah will guide. I'm telling you, most of our parents, most of us sitting in this room, our parents didn't read 15, did not read 15 books on parenting. They made dua to Allah. They did shura. They took advice from the people around them. They did what was, in their, what was their ability, what was their best judgment. They spoke to the scholars and they did what they could. And at the end of it, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided their children. What fear do we have that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't guide our children and won't guide our communities? And openness will come after difficulty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 28, 28 of Surah Shura, ma qanatu wa yanshur rahmata. That is Allah who gave them mercy, who showered his mercy upon them after they became despondent. They lost hope and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning they were right at the brink of losing hope and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy came. So with every difficulty, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then says, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا With every difficulty comes ease. As Allah says in the Quran, سَيَجَعَلُ اللَّهُ بَعْدَ عُسْرٍ يُسْرًا That very soon after your difficulty, Allah will bring ease. Now notice that this hadith keeps talking about difficulty, difficulty, difficulty. Did you guys notice that? Constant difficulty? Follow the chain of hadith. Follow the way the hadith started. Be mindful of Allah, Allah will take care of you. If you're not mindful of Allah and difficulty comes to you, that could be a punishment for you in the world. We know that. If a person is 
negligent of the rights of Allah, it's very possible the calamity they face is a punishment from Allah. So how do you avoid that punishment coming in the world? Ihfadillah yahfadk. Build your iman from day one. If you build strong iman in your days of ease, that's when that iman will help you when you're in calamity. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, build a relationship with Allah in your time of ease, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist you in your time of difficulty. The Prophet is teaching us. Tomorrow you don't know what difficulty is going to slap you in the face. The only way your iman will remain that day is if today you build good iman. Today you make dua to Allah, today you make dhikr. And then the Prophet ﷺ takes Ibn Abbas one's mind to the next, next discussion. Trust and know that Allah is in full control. No one can harm you. No one can help you without Allah. No one else has a hand in your life. No one gets to control the ultimate outcome of your life. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do you need to do? Sabr. Be patient. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Continue doing good what you're doing. Because remember, and then the Prophet closes off, after every difficulty comes ease. With every narrowness comes openness. With patience comes the help of Allah. Wasbiru. Wallahu ma'as sabirin. Inna Allahu ma'as sabirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, with those who are, in, uh, who, who, are, who are facing difficulty and calamity. So with that we close off a beautiful hadith. Again, there are so many more points that could be covered. But due to um, time restraints, we will leave it here inshallah. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq. Allah azza wa give us, gives us the ability to implement these lessons. Such a powerful lesson. And the Every element of this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ giving this advice to a young child, he's focusing on the kids in the community, focusing on the youth, not only focusing on Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, who are all there, but he's focusing on the teenagers even till the end of his life. Because the Prophet ﷺ knows these are the people that are going to carry the flag forward. The Prophet ﷺ develops and he builds this young man's personality because every young man, every young girl has some sort of an identity crisis. They're trying to figure out who should their crew be? What are they going to be? What's their life going to look like? What kind of people are they going to be with? You know, when they're 13 years old, they dress one way. When they're 14 years old, they dress another way. When they're 15 years old, they dress another way. You just make dua to Allah, by the time they're 18, they're still dressing. Right? That's how people are. That's where they're going. So the Prophet ﷺ is preparing these companions and he's saying, Ibn Abbas is building his identity. Trust Allah. Be mindful of Allah. Your life may take you in different directions, but make sure ultimately you're grounded. And if I could translate that in our, in our times, be grounded to the masjid. Telling the youth, be grounded to your imams. When I meet a young man or a young lady and I ask them, who's the imam at your masjid? And they say, I don't know their name. It terrifies me. Because if you don't know the name of your imam, what does that say? That imam is not playing an active role in your life. This goes to the adults and the youth. If someone asks you, what's the name of your imam, and you don't know, that means you're not engaging properly. You need to go and reach out to them, and they need to reach out to you. Build a bond with Islam and the deen, and anchor yourself in. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq, protects us and our progeny until the day of judgment. Allah azza wa does not deprive any of our children from iman. Allah allows us to live on iman, and die on iman, and resurrect us with the mu'mineen, salihin on the day of judgment. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.